everybody and welcome to the Damcasters and our final part of our Boeing's Fortresses mini-series this week on the evergreen B-52 Strato Fortress. And we take a detour because we do need to talk about the B-47 because it's a stunner and has a very interesting story itself because you can't link the B-52 without having that intermediary step to the B-47 as well. Now, of course, if you want to see in the flesh or in the metal all of the aircraft that we've discussed in the series so far, I'm pretty sure it's all of them. I should really check that. But let's say anyways, all the aircraft that you've seen featured in this series, except maybe the TU-4, which would be cool if they get that. But head, of course, to the fabulous Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, which is aviation fan mecca. They have got hundreds of aircraft featuring from all aspects of aviation, civilian stuff, NASA aircraft. We featured a load of them on the show, including Sophia, the Airborne Telescope. It is an incredible journey. A day is not enough because there is just so much to see and they're incredibly friendly and the team there will welcome you out to the desert next to the Boneyard to see the fantastic collection they have there. So head to www.pimaair.org to see just how vast the collection is and some of the gems they have going on in their collection, which go see it. I'm heading back in November. It's going to be great. We'll do some more videos and things. I also have to thank Tom and the amazing team at 909 Apparel. They're doing some great stuff for their t-shirts, including their new premium range. I have all of the episodes have featured me in their gray tops. They have more colors, but head over to 909apparel.com to find out more. They're doing some really fun designs and I wear them all the time, which I suppose is endorsement enough for me here on the Damcasters. And throughout the series, you've seen some incredible aerials from the Pima Air and Space Museum. And they're all down to the fantastic Ramon Purcell at Boneyard Safari, who you have to check out what he's doing online. He's doing the booping, which is funny, but his photography and the access he gets to some incredible places and in aircraft, including some of the crash sites he's going to remember those who lost their lives in the crashes in the Western and Southwest United States is really moving. So check him out as well. Links in the description below, like, and subscribe, because here we go. This was our four of our recording as Ben Skipper and I sat down to discuss his last Boeing's Fortress book in the Pen and Sword Flightcraft series about the B-52 Strato Fortress. This aircraft is going to outlast us all, but we're going to have to get into just how it came about. And you'll have to indulge us because we were getting tired by this point. We've been talking a lot. So on with the show and on with us post our only comfort break in our marathon recording session. It's been three weeks, Ben, and we're still at this, still wearing the same clothes, dear listener. We've got one and a half Fort Boeing's fortresses <laughs> still to do. Because this one is your latest book, and congratulations on it. It's just out. Thank you. And again, same sort of format as the others. Lots of fantastic pictures, great modeling aspects as well. Penn and Sword have done a great job putting it together. But we're not actually going to start with the B-52, are we? Because we can't make that jump from B-29 straight to B-52 because there is a very sleek, very pretty, very misunderstood Boeing bomber that comes between them in the B-47. Yeah. Why so, do we? Yeah. Why do we need to talk about B fifty seven before we talk about B fifty two? Well, well, the thing is, it, it's really interesting. So we've got the B twenty nine. B twenty nine ushers in. It, it, it literally comes in as the Cold War's starting. And at this point, um, we've got the jet engine. Everything is turbojet. You know, doctrine of the USAF now is jets. You know, um, do you want a propeller? No, we're having a jet. Do you want helicopters? No, we're having a jet. Everything is about jets. Jet power is the way ahead. It's the new AI. It's the AI of the 1950s. <laughs> um, this, isn't, this is a great period of experimentation. As we touched on 
in the last episode, you know, the, the X1. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, further, faster, farther. It was, you know, they were they were going nuts. So, what do Boeing do? So they do the B fifty. But oh, but you know, I mean, okay, I get it in a way. Do I? No, I don't actually, because they do something really remarkable. They create this beautifully sleek, as you said, slightly odd looking B forty seven jet, six jet, six jet engines on it, four which are in pods. And they produce over 2,000 of these things. And nobody talks about it. And, and it, it's a book. Who knows? I, I may get to write at some point. I mean, I've, I've been very lucky with both with Pen and Sword letting me do the, the full chair of the fortresses. I did not employ any blackmail in that at all. <laughs> I, I didn't degrade myself by crying down the phone once. I was waking up. Um, this is, uh, are you familiar with the book Empire of the Skies? Yes. Uh, that's, that's quite. That's a very good insight into what was going on at this time. You know, it was great experimentation. So, the, so Boeing created this, like I said, this the six engined, uh, six jet, turbo jet engined uh, bomber. It wasn't brilliant, but it it defined uh, a generation. It was epoch making. So, you know, this was the Americans' first multi jet bomber. It wasn't the first multi jet bomber. That was the Arado. It introduced quite a few concepts. Um, the main one being specifically designed for the carriage of nuclear of special weapons. Yeah, I know the B B twenty nine was sort of there, but you know the Manhattan Project may well have failed. You know, uh, Oppenheimer may well have set fire to the um, could well have set fire to the atmosphere. Thankfully, he didn't. Um, <laughs> but, but now the Americans knew what they were doing. Doctrine was starting to to take shape. We were led by Cold War. We were led by um, distrust on both sides. You know, NATO was new. Uh, the USAF was new. Warsaw Pact very new. Well, uh, and the development, but the development of nuclear weapons was escalating quite rapidly. The Americans were keen to have something that was fast in the air and capable of, of de develop of delivering um, a special weapon. On a specific target, you know, people forget that this it was all in the air. <laughs> we had no ICBMs really. Yeah, and no, the Americans were messing around with ground delivered nukes, and missiles were sort of getting there, but weren't really on 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 on, on spec as it were. But it, it introduced so many concepts to the Americans, didn't it? it? Introduced the use of nuclear weapons. How to? This is a whole new doctrine, and I, and I really feel for the USAF, because they're, they're fighting this battle between missile, who's, which is being um, championed by no less than Brigadier Gavin. Brigadier Gavin, that's the guy who uh, bridged too far, broke his coccyx on landing. Uh, Eindhoven. Eindhoven, yeah. Yeah, yeah, broke his, yeah. yeah. So he, he's going to be into, be into missiles. It's the way ahead. We had the Sunday review, which said the same thing. Every, um, everybody was enamored with jets and with missiles, and they didn't know yeah. which way to jump. No, they really didn't. Is, is manned crews the way ahead? Do we, you know? But with with jet aircraft, the realization was they were because they were faster. We didn't they didn't need necessarily huge amounts of defensive armor, if any. You know, tail gun on the back, that'll be fine. Um, small crew, bombardier, navigator, pilot. Uh, okay, let's do that. How big do you want the fuselage? Oh, it doesn't have to be that big, just because the jets, they're that powerful, you get them on a good wing, strap it to the side of a reasonably aerodynamic uh, fuselage, they'll just do what he wants. Okay. So what you have is a very simple looking aircraft. Big, big wingspan though. Because it's quite, it, right. it's, it, the B-47, B it wasn't a small aeroplane uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It was this wingspan that stood up. So, and it had these six, which yeah. we, we, we just should drop in here as well. The the front line, other front line intercontinental bomber at this time is the B-36 Peacemaker as well, which is... I was about to come on to that. Oh, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> no, I, no, no. We're, no, we're, we're in my wheelhouse. B-47, B-36 <laughs> is my happy place. It really is. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so the B-36, no, we need to talk about this yeah. because this is really important. Both aircraft are really important to the B-52. And what the B fifty two how it came out. So the B thirty six, wonderful aircraft. Um, it was designed um, 
if you you know if you if you're wearing this, I'm sorry. I hope you don't, you don't suck eggs. But it was designed uh, to bomb continental Europe, assured all of continental Europe and fall to the Germans. Uh, that meant United Kingdom and Ireland, possibly Iceland. So the Americans wanted an aircraft that would cross the Atlantic, bomb the Germans, and then come back again. That's where the Convair B-36 had its had its roots. And I've seen a few people say recently, oh, it was the original nuclear bomber. When when the, no, it wasn't. It, when when the the actual the 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 PRO went out for it, the design brief went out. It was 1937, I believe. 36, 37. You know, nuclear weapons, special weapons, were stuff of science fiction. That was the stuff of Flash Gordon. Uh, no, this was a conventional bomber. It was a big one, but it was a conventional bomber. <laughs> Just like he said, it was a big one. It's like, nah, it's it's bigger than it's that. huge. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so on the on the sliding the skipper sliding scale of vehicles. So we've got the, <laughs> so we've got so we got the you know we got the uh, the B fifty, the B twenty nine. It's been doing a bit of bombing post war. It's it's, it's been doing it, earning its keep. Yeah, it's, it's it's now looking a little jaded. So it's it's probably now looking more like I don't know. Uh, a 1963 Rover, <laughs> B five. Um, all on, all of a sudden comes the B thirty six. Now the B thirty six, this is huge. This this is this is like monster truck territory uh, in terms of automotive. You know the wheels are as big as an individual. You know, it's it's a monster. It carries two crews. It's that big, and it finds itself being used in in, in the hemisphere only. They're really precious about this. It's like, you know, when when the B-17 was introduced, the US Navy said, you can't fly that beyond 100 miles, nautical miles of the coast, because it's, you're interfering with us. You know, they, they literally restrict this thing to Northern Hemisphere operations. And they put it all, they put them on one base, don't they? Mm -hmm. all, all, yeah. They so this is, this is really important. So you got this bomber, which... Was designed as a conventional bomber now fulfilling the role as a nuclear cape bomber. Thankfully, it doesn't need too much modification because a fat man's shape is roughly what nuclear weapons are still in this shape at this point. Um, they've got they've got three hundred of these things. I think it was. It's, it's nuts. Absolutely yeah. nuts. It, and, yeah. and it's yeah, you know, go back to, go back to what I'm about to say. I don't think, you, unless you stand by it or even close to it, you have no idea how big it was. I mean, there's a lovely photograph of the B-17, the B-29, and the B-36 together. Don't know where it was taken. And you're like, you know, it was longer than the, the Wright brothers' first flight. This thing was that big. <laughs> it's got a lovely, perfectly spare, um, cylindrical fuselage yeah. and the most monstrous, ugly wing you're ever going to see on an airplane. And, and the thing, and it was that heavy. So when it came to actually, you know, it came about the right, you know, the, the, using the technology of the pre-war technology to build this thing, it was quite heavy. You know, these the, the six pushers, which was absolutely barking. Because on the, on the B version, they slapped a couple of, they, they, they slapped engine pods, didn't they? Um, yeah. Jets on, on, on Yeah, J-37s, I think on the it was. Yeah. yeah, just just to get it going. <laughs> this thing was huge. I say it was it was immense, um, but but it was it, it's it's quite central to what happens and how the B fifty two is used because between that and the B forty seven, the, the U.S. Air Force had was sport for choice and then nature intervened. <laughs> and one night there was a really bad wind, <laughs> and they, they lost half their B thirty six fleet, literally didn't they overnight? Yep. Yep. There's a, there's, a, there's a story in a podcast just in that storm, but we'll come back to that on another time. Yeah, you know, it's like, so it took out half of it, half of the United States long range, very heavy bomber capacity, leaving the B-47, which is rapidly finding itself becoming a bit of an everyman. It's like the America's version of the English electric lightning. It's sort of taking on bombing roles. It's taking on um, reconnaissance, it's, it's weather, training. Of, uh, aggressor it's, it's everything and i really feel sorry for the b47 because it didn't have a chance to shout in anger yeah you know it just falls in that sort of middle bit bef between anything major happening yeah but in fairness to boeing they designed a very very good aircraft because mm. it was it was like a gateway to what was come which would be the b52 the buff the big ugly fella 
score. Well, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we'll just make sure I don't have to tick that particular box on the <laughs> on the ad suitability one. Yeah. Um, and Boeing, they, they cut their teeth, you know, as you were saying, you know, they cut their teeth, and again, the wing design. This is quite important because... Which, which, is, all... which is a theme that we've been talking about through our, our conversations is yeah. they get the wing right in the B-17. It allows it to do a lot. The wing is right in the B-29. Allows it to do a lot. The wing on the B-47 is different enough that it then allows them to make the jump to the buff. He's like, so the, it, it is, it's the first time they're using a wing with multiple engines. Um, mm -hmm. And the, you know, what, what become, what be, you know, what starts is with the design brief for the B-52 can be traced back sort of late forties. Possibly, you know, if you really want to, you look at, you look at the round, the, the B-29D, uh, 1945, 46. They have to design something very unique. Um, not only, to get the prize of the contract of building this this big aircraft, but also uh, to be able to carry the engines it needs, which at this time, you know, it's, it's, jet engines aren't particularly powerful with the first ones. You know, that's why we had these these four pods. They're relying on some very small engines to do a lot of work. But also, it's a moment to refine a, a slightly swept wing design that could be used elsewhere, as you were saying, 707. It ends up being almost a universal wing for Boeing. Now, the, the next part is, is quite interesting because it's a huge wing. B-47, poor B-47 is languishing because it's no longer the baby. Um, Boeing are now looking at going very heavy bomber with, with, a, jet, with a jet aircraft. They're thinking B-29 meets B-47 and it gives us this monster. So the B-52... Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> so as the B-52 is being designed and refined, um, Curtis LeMay makes a reappearance. Ah, my, my boy, Curtis. <laughs> um, and, and this is quite interesting because Strategic Air Command uh, are now driving the design process a little bit more than their predecessors. They know what they want. And Curtis LeMay, he knows Boeing, he knows they're going to deliver, he knows well, those boys, you know. Yep. And he needs an air. And what really helps Boeing inadvertently is the fact that LeMay's vision of the future sees the B B B fifty two not clumped together like the B forty sevens or the B thirty sixes in a single base or several single bases. He sees them being a dispersed asset. He also envisages a B fifty two being in the sky at all times as a deterrent. You know, while the, while the B thirty six can do this, it's slow. You know, we, we see what we saw what happened with the B twenty nine in Korea. The B thirty B thirty six, you know, sh should should it all go horribly wrong, that's gone before it can even be used. You know, the, the Soviet air defence will be hitting that pretty hard, and it's and it shows up as a big old target apparently on the radar. It was huge. It was like a barn door. This thing. So you knew exactly what it was. And bearing in mind that the adoption of this sort of northern hemispheric um, patrol position that, that took American aircraft over Canada while they still could um, at that point, past Greenland, down Iceland, bottom of the United Kingdom, sometimes even going as low as the Mediterranean and back round. It was, it was a big old loop of, of, a, of a patrol loop. So it is something that could do that in relative comfort. And I can imagine trying to, even trying to do that in a, if, if it had the, the endurance of a propellant aircraft would have been absolute purgatory. Yeah. Um, you know, they're noisy. They're uncomfortable. They're exceptionally noisy, actually. So trying to work in that environment must have been, you know, for any period of time, hats off to the guys in the B-29s doing the long runs to Japan. <laughs> um the other thing is the B-29 was able to take advantage of all of the latest innovations in avionics because avionics were now becoming more electronically based. Radar was being a lot was getting a lot better. Um, you know, you, you looked at H, H2S right back in the day of the B-17. Um, we've gone from that to stuff with made by Honeywell and all just 
Oh, it's almost science fiction in a very short period of time. It's as much a platform of avionics as it is a weapons platform. And like all Boeing aircraft, uh, especially the bombers of the Fortress family, as it continues to fly, it continues to do so with <coughs> an increased bomb load, increased range, and increased capacity and capabilities. So by the time it's introduced, uh, 1956, I believe. So I'll check now. I think February 1955. 1955. Wow. Okay. So which I stole from your book. So don't don't worry. It's yeah. all coming from a good place. Oh, sorry. Yeah, at least, at least he knows what he's talking about. Um, so when, when it comes online, this this is the new thing. It's bright. It's shiny. It it's aggressive. It's the strangest looking thing you've ever seen, especially when it's in the silver finish. It's odd. Um, silver finish doesn't last terribly long because when it's being tested in Edwards, they found that somebody realised that if this thing went down, they won't be able to find it because it's silver finish would reflect its environment. <laughs> so it'd be like looking for a mirror. <laughs> so they had to put these horrible... These, can great big day glow stripes on on the on, on wings and upper surfaces um to help locate it if it went down and there's this lovely picture of uh b52a alongside um an Ivory vulcan uh, mark ii over edwards the mark yeah. ii is lovely anti-flash looks beautiful and then you got the b52 it was ugly <laughs> and yeah. it's i'm sorry it was it's a hideous looking aircraft <laughs> You know, it's it is definitely for more of a function, especially coming. Uh, the forty-seven is pretty. It is. It's it's that nineteen like forties almost science fiction. It, you expect it to see it on the cover of some pulp novel. Yeah. Whereas the fifty-two looks like it's gone a few rounds with Tyson and had the nice edges <laughs> battered off off of it, and or you know, sorry, fifties Rocky Marciano or somebody like that. It yeah. Uh, Ignatius uh, probably is a better way to say them. I like that. I like that. Yeah. Probably, and it is. It's it's a it's a lump of an aircraft. And what's interesting, you know, Boeing knew with the B four seven, they're on aesthetically, they're onto a good thing because the, the initial A had the tandem cockpit. I understand fully why they went, why they changed it, because the first two productions had the tandem cockpit, and then they, you know, the, the Air Force went, no, nah, I don't think we need that. That was to be 47. That was designed to be smallish. That everything was at the front, you know. Yep. Didn't have all the weapons officers you need to, to, to run a, a contemporary modern aircraft. So let's have it side by side. Let's let's return to the B B29, B17 model, which probably maybe may well have been in part why it was given the, the, the fortress moniker. But what, what they they produced was was quite a remarkable aircraft because Initially, it was in this sort of standoff role. It was doing patrols, um, you know, armor nuclear weapons, special weapons in the Northern Hemisphere and in the Southern Hemisphere. It was. We, we should just say it was Strato Jet for the forty-seven, wasn't it? And then Strato was, Fortress. Yeah. Strato yeah. Fortress. I mean, Strato Jet just sounds brilliant, doesn't it? Yes. Again, I'm going to my Strato yes. Jet. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, Strato Jet Ginger? Where are you going, Strato Fortress? Mm. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. It's no wonder they don't call it that it. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the Strato jet would look great with a couple of early lightnings by the side of it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah what well, would you fly against the side of a B 52? Yeah. What's the ugliest jet fighter you can think of? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. <laughs> any, any, any number of the century <laughs> fighters, really. I, mean, I, I don't know. Uh, what's, what's, put, what's, put a Sabre. Not Sabre. The, uh, the Voodoo is probably the ugliest of the bunch. I'm going to get flack for that because we skipped that when we did our Century Series video. And the comments is all, well, you didn't do the F101. We'll do that later, dear listener. But yeah, ugly airplane. Uh, ugly, you know, then morphs uh, into a beautiful airplane in the F4. But that, again, is a... It's, it's a joy of development. Yeah. <laughs> get it wrong <laughs> once, make it pretty next time. Yeah, the, the, the joy of... The joy, yeah, of uh... So, so this thing is rolled out, is, and it actually they rolled it out very quickly. I think most of the problems came from from the motive power. Again, it seems to be a perennial Boeing issue: engines. They mm. designed some really good aircraft, but they don't have the engines for them, or they're underpowered. Um, 
And the original J57, or 57. Um, they had to be wet, they had to be boosted with ethanol, uh, just to get this thing off the ground at times. But the concept worked. I mean, what, and again, what's interesting with the engines, they were designed that they could be the aircraft could be dispersed um, all over the United States, all over the continental United States, all over Europe, smaller air, airfields without all the infrastructure. They had a, a charge pack. I don't know if you've seen these these cartridge charge packs, mm -hmm. size of a satchel, throw it in, big bang. So there's a video on YouTube somewhere where it shows you doing it in the 80s. I think that's, that particular video is responsible for accelerating global warming for about five years. Because it's just, what do I just watch? That's mad. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, the B-52 could carry quite a lot of its maintenance bits and pieces within its bomb bay. It's got a special cradle. So I think that there is a photograph of it in the book. Uh, it's where the, the crew put crew baggage, you know, stuff like that. It's forward. There's a sort of ledge bit. Yeah. As I found when I was crawling around the, the MB 52A. <laughs> this, as far as I got, my body would not allow me to go down the little walkway in the Bombay for, for any further than that. I mean, and again, the Bombay was quite interesting because, again, they had that tube, the, the, the ubiquitous uh, Boeing tube, and actually managed to get somebody down it. They, they connected the, the front portion of the aircraft to the rear portion, but you could only use it if the whole aircraft was depressurized. So that meant flying below 8,000 feet. And apparently it was, it was doable. I wouldn't like to have done it because it's no. a long, old way to crawl. Because yeah. it wasn't like the conveyor where you had a trolley and a, and a rope, um, the B-36. Because the, the B-29 had like padding, didn't it, that sort of flopped forward on that. Thing. <laughs> it was like early breakdancing. Yeah. <laughs> Doing the worm. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, you know, you have to worm your way now. Dear, had, dear had... listener, if you've not figured out, we've been recording this for quite a while now. You've seen we've reached the the silly point of the <laughs> of the three episodes. But yes, anyways, tubes, tubes. So, so that you know, that was one way of transiting on the, <laughs> internally in the flight. I, I think I think it was actually sort of actively. Um... No, don't do it, lads. No. You can do it, but just because you can doesn't mean you have to. Sort of. Uh, vibe, I think I get with that. Um, but again, it, another pressurized aircraft, hence the reason why it has that really odd wrinkling finish. Mm. Well, if, so if you ever see a picture of them, they're not badly built. That's deliberate. Because <laughs> so, I've, I've shown it to a couple of people, but God, have I finished it? What do you mean? What was all that damage? So that's not damage. It'll pop out once they pressurize the cabin. Yeah. But on the early aircraft, they were renowned for being quite cold mm. because the, the heating wasn't brilliant. Well, because you couldn't tap too much off the engines because they didn't have no, Because the engines were, were really that yeah. good. And again, this was going to be, and, it, and it's not, not still a problem, but it's still an area of concern. And they were, you know, that they were, they were toying, especially from the sort of <clears throat> late 80s of having four engines, which would make sense, really. Mm. Um, but because the wings can droop right out you know, at the tips, they can be four foot, just four foot from the floor. Yeah. I think that, that was quite a concern as well. That have these big old units, uh, they were looking at Rolls Royce. Uh, RB2 for, yeah. for a while, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I think the problem, and the other thing is because of what it developed into, you know, mm. which will come on to in a minute. The So initially it was purely sentry duties with a nuclear weapon in one of several locations. Um, crew training was. No different to how it had been with with B four seven in terms of how it was operated um, in the air uh, and the actual doctrine. But I think what ha what did change was how it was used uh, as an aircraft, especially when intercontinental ballistic missiles came on the scene, because all of a sudden it lost its niche place. You know, this thing could carry two nuclear weapons, four in a push. Uh, you know, when they, when they were lost, there were, there were a couple of famous losses, mm. one in Canada um, and one in the Algarve. Mm. Um, and a special weapon that was lost in the Algarve, is, you know, one of them has never been recovered. Um, it's still was, there doing something. I, I, you know what? It's probably giving the fish five eyes. It's yeah. like the Simpsons fish. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but again, you know, two big losses for the amount of hours they were doing. And these things were in the air a huge amount of time. You know, they were they were they even had their, their own dedicated um, 
refueling aircraft, the KC-135. People forget that. When, when, they, when, when the B-52 went up in the air, this was the whole package now. They, you know, they, they, used, they, they weren't messing around. They used to have been business. Where the B-47 and the B-36 were, <clears throat> certainly, certainly in the case of the B-36, a stopgap. And the B-47, a refinement of process. The, the B-52 is now the daddy. This was how it was going to be, you know. So as such, it attracted the best crews. Yep. And LeMay was absolutely rigid on that. There was, there was no discussion. And this was ground crew and air crew. He wanted the best. Their families, they wanted the best bases. They had the, you know, the best bases, the best housing, the best food, the best social life. Because these were the guys who ultimately would go off, should it all go horribly wrong, may not return or look in the rearview mirrors as something drops and a bucket of sunshine is released on their home. Mm-hmm. So... LeMay was very clear on, on promoting the B-52 force as the elite of, of the SAC. And, and to to the, his credit, he was right. You know, he got the best pilots, uh, the best ground crew, <clears throat> beautifully supported. And, and it put, um, it, certainly, it certainly put SAC on the map as, as in terms of professionalism. This changed with the introduction of ICBMs, though. For which there's fascinating conversation to be had around command and control of those the fight between the navy and the air force which is still going on today to oh a degree. it was it was um, yeah sorry no no can continue no uh, you're right it was because the navy i don't think they ever got over the fact they lost mm. <laughs> <laughs> the lost proverbial but you know billy mitch when billy mitchell showed them up in 1921 i don't think they ever got over that no. um and and this this has been ever you know there was always this sort of we should have control of, of, of an in, there should be an independent air force it should belong to us and the RAF had the same thing it's certainly with the RAF with the army and the air you know the Royal Navy who has what but LeMay proved that actually an independent air force was vital in terms of national security because he could do what he was meant to do which defend uh, the country ICBM has changed that sorry yeah go on. It, it, it's it's that overt um, presence isn't it when you have yeah. that many aircraft flying around it, it's there uh, as amazing and as I do find nuclear submarines fascinating, their whole job is to not be seen and not known to be where they are. Whereas if you've got sack bombers up in the air all the time, as deterrents go, it's not too bad, even though we since found there wasn't as much on the other side as... <laughs> as <they laughs> I tell you what, they won the propaganda war, didn't they? Oh, goodness, you know? yeah. I mean, just, just as an aside, there's a fantastic yeah. paper that's come out on the intelligence behind the cancellation of the Avro era. And the whole thing is about the Canadian analysts going, yeah, that doesn't stack up. And the Americans going, oh, they have all these things. And the, part of the thing that went to Diefenbaker was Canadian intelligence saying, they don't have that many bombers. It's Bomb interesting. Missiles. Mm. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I mean, it, that has shown if you look at the fact that they've still got the TU-95 in service. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah we, we, we talk about who's going to hit the, the century first. Is it going to be the TU-95 or is it going to be the uh, B-52 uh, as a military aircraft? It's going to be the B-52 because it was in service about six months before the TU-95. <laughs> but it just showed you where, where Soviet thinking was. It was very much propeller. Uh, keep it simple, stupid, you know, because that's the way they operated. Turbojet, yeah, we can remove that. We can repair that. We get the parts from the local tractor factory. Can't really get a, you know, an injector for a jet, you know, a turbo, turbo jet from, I don't know, uh, the Red October tractor factory, which just makes tractors. But we can get the parts where we need, you know. It, and it also shows socially and culturally where, where they were, where both, both sides were in terms of how they viewed their their deterrent and their strategic forces. The Americans were very keen and did push the, the technological edge continuously until the 80s. And they were very good at that, don't get me wrong. The Soviets almost gave up in the late 60s, 70s because of the cost, I think. Yeah. You know, going back to this sort of conversation, well, what, what, what could SAC do now? Uh, now that we had ICBMs, uh, and they were viable. We had land-based missiles that were viable. And, you know, if we've got them, guess what? 
so the Soviets. <laughs> Industrial espionage uh, was. They're never, they're never going to get rid of it. They're always going to have a weak link of the chain. So the B-52, very nearly, I mean, it was, it was lucky. They had built this force up, and within five years, it was literally like it was going to go to Arizona and be cocooned or cut in half. But I, I think it was also realising that this thing could also carry a conventional bomb load, which it did, and then the Americans didn't practice with it as much as certainly the, the RAF did. All of a sudden, they, they had to get used to conventional bombing again and retrain how to do it uh, with, with very large aircraft. And they were able to take it out to put that conventional conversion in because they had things like the Hustlers sitting there, the, the um, B-58, still being able to do that deterrent role, which wasn't as easy to convert because it had an external pod for a Bombay and things like that. We will return to the use of the Hustler in conventional roles in the episode coming up pretty soon, actually. But, oh, there you go. Bit, bit, of, bit, of bit of a cheeky bit insight. Of, bit of a che cheeky, cheeky thing there. But let, let's get into that because the role shifts. And as we get up through the various marks of, of B-52 as well, that adaptability that you, you've been mentioning through each of the Boeing fortresses is is there not only does it just become a bomb bus it can carry almost anything can't it yeah it, it's remarkable that the boeing continue this adherence uh to appreciating listening and uh, to the service user yeah but most most companies don't do that especially this day and age you know we want this this and this no, you know you're still going to have that but we want to add this but that's how used to what i want but no boeing were were keenly aware of their market position i think you had aircraft, like the lighter aircraft coming online, like the Hustler, like the F-111, they were nuclear mm -hmm. capable, faster, uh, sleeker. You, you know, <clears throat> by the 60s, things were settling down. You had the Sentry Jets. I'm sure someone at some point thought, Starfighter, special weapon. Without thinking the fact <laughs> that you can't carry a special weapon above supersonic speeds. But that doesn't make any difference because if somebody would have thought it, somebody would go, oh, yeah, you got an idea there. Yeah. In a bar. <laughs> Four beers into the evening. That's oh yeah, the idea yeah, yeah. The, 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 the peanuts are being dropped left, right, and centre as these two lunatics are coming with an idea. <laughs> um, so you know, you, you've got the, the you know Boeing are contending with that. So they do what Boeing do best; they adapt. Like I say, as as they progress, as the marks of the aircraft progress, and experience is gained, and technology is developed by nineteen sixty five, they're, they're pretty much there. They're pretty much got the perfect very heavy bomber it's the g at this point mm -hmm. um you know the d is the d is the one that's mostly in service and, and it's the d that really cuts its teeth um in, in southeast asia because all of a sudden the americans american involvement uh, especially in vietnam escalates you, you know you've got the big westmoreland push You've got this this almost irrational fear of uh, communism in a in a place that doesn't really affect America as a nation state doesn't doesn't affect the slightest. But what happens is it, it becomes a playground, as Korea had done between the Warsaw Pact and NATO, or more more accurately, America and Russia. And you know the, the Soviets were keen to find somewhere to to test their weaponry. Uh, and going back to what you were saying, all of a sudden, the Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, have access to radar guided SUs, <laughs> um, missiles. Uh, what was it? SS. It's early one, is it? SS. I want to say six. Is that right? So six. I think it was a six. It was very yeah. odd. They, yeah. So they, they, you know, the, 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 the version of the Hawk, and the Americans are keen to see what the the B fifty two can do. First raids, yeah, the linebacker raids. Uh, they, they, I don't know whether to say they were infamous or famous. They showed <laughs> they 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 were it's almost it's, it's an awful insane, but they were essential in the development of U.S. doctrine because they have nothing uh, anti-radiation in service. You know, we, they had ECM capabilities. We, you know, they've been they've been going since. Second World War, you know, when the RAF were using uh, B-17Gs in that role, 90 Squadron uh, in particular. Mm -hmm. 
So you know, the B-52 was lucky, it could supply its own ECM uh, countermeasures. I mean, you know, it led to the development of the wild weasel concept um, yep. for the lighter aircraft, which was brilliant. But while the, while the smaller aircraft were getting absolutely hammered, somehow the B-52s again were surviving some pretty heavy damage. I mean, yes, there were losses and there, there always will be. But this again showed that the fortress name, uh, yeah, was well placed. Um, I mean, one of the earliest catastrophes that the aircraft experienced you know, was an A, which had its tail sheared. It's quite a famous photograph of this thing coming into land, isn't there? Yeah. And the tails disappeared because something, something happened with their wing loading or whatever. So they I knew it was. It was one of the ones doing low level. Um, flights wasn't it hit an oscillation because yeah. they lost a couple to that when they were doing their comparative tests with the um the hustler and things um because it had yeah. um we, we should mention the first bunch had the super tall tail and then they went to the the stubby one later on yeah, so, well, so, so that's the, how you yeah. can really tell how old a be yeah so the, the, well, they're, they're all the old aren't they but yeah I mean, it was it was basically. I think it was from the G, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. G H. Yeah, the G that had the slight, had a slight error as well. Um, it's a bit like you know, it's a bit like the B uh, B seventeen. They had their tail was redesigned with, with the advent of the rear gun. It had a fillet on it as well. So you know, if you're ever in doubt, look for the fillet at the back leading up to the tail. But yeah, there were there were very slight changes. There were no dramatic. I mean, if you look at the B twenty nine, externally the only dramatic change was the propeller. Mm. Uh, and the finish, but there were there were subtle changes, but they were effective changes. But either way, um, you know these aircraft were able to absorb quite a lot of damage. Um, you know the, the actual effectiveness of the rate of the, of the linebacker raids, both one and two, have always been called into question in terms of losses gained to uh, strategic advantage you know, compared to the strategic advantage. But they defined how conventional forces would be used 25 years later in Gulf, in, in, the, in Operation Grand Bureau. Um, what was it? Uh, Operation Freedom. Yeah, Desert, Desert Shield. Storm. Desert Storm. Yeah. yeah, Desert Storm and Desert Shield. So it was very much a testing ground for how the Americans used conventional weaponry. But yeah, they, they struggled. They lost aircraft to SAMs. Crews were captured. Um, I found the bit because linebacker one and two were the Nixon ones around the time of the Paris conference. Yes. Either side. Uh, before that was um, Rolling Thunder. And Which then, was very successful. And there's there's a whole thing to do on Rolling yeah. Thunder because it, it, it was combined U.S. Air Force operations. It was everything at all levels. It, fascinating, fascinating character. Yeah, this is the thing when you when you're writing histories about aircraft, they're involved in so many things. And, you th and, and afterwards, I don't know what happened. I'll say, oh, I should have mentioned that, or mm -hmm. you know, converse evil. And, and that shows you when you're dealing with an aircraft that's still in service over so seventy years later, it's going to have a lot of history behind it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the fifty-two wasn't in Rolling Thunder, but that was everything else. Yeah. And then, the... and then was it Arc? Oh, you've got it here. Oh, right. Look at your book. There you go. Arc, arc like the one that was yeah. the, the year um, or the six months later, something like that, uh, that they tried to do it again, but it didn't have the same. Didn't have the same effect because the Vietnamese were ready for them. Yeah. They were, they had Soviet advisors. Their air defense was certainly refined. So by the time of linebacker two, yeah. you know, um, pretty much the last time they used the B-52 in, in that respect, and it became very much a support weapon elsewhere. What's quite interesting is that during the Vietnam period, earlier marks are now phased out of service. Um, the D was pretty much coming to the end of its service life, same with the E, they'd, they'd had a lot of hammer actually. So by the early early to mid seventies, you were left with the, the G and the H. Now what's quite interesting at this point, this is <laughs> one of life's ironies that this, this is the beginning of the, the B-52 outlasting some of the technology decided to replace it, <laughs> or at least the embarrassing. They, they started mounting AGM series, uh, air guided missiles, to, you know, cruise missiles, as we would call them, to the B-52s uh, on pylons. This was something that hadn't been envisaged. And one of the big ones was the Skybolt, which if you 
you'd see RAF history, RAF very nearly bought into. And it was because the RAF pulled out. It, Sky Bowl was never really going to happen. It was an expensive solution to a question that hadn't been answered, especially when you had the likes of the AGM 68 and 86 very much on the horizon. Mm -hmm. So crews returned to the United States. The, the American military from sort of 75 to about 79, it wasn't a great time. Morale was pretty poor. Strategic forces, they were using, they were in their silos with Atlas and Minuteman and everything else. The B-52 wasn't really much on the scene. And, and it's almost like a, a period of isolationism for, for American, American military aviation. I mean, there were big changes. You had the, the F-15 coming online, the F-16 coming, the next generation of jet aircraft. You also had the B-1 uh, B Lancer appearing, the Rockwell B-1 Lancer appearing. Now, this was designed to replace the B-52. <laughs> I'm only chuckling because this is brilliant. This is beautiful, isn't it? Huge aircraft, sweet wing, which everything was sweat wing, wasn't it? You know, in the 70s, the F 14, uh, tornado. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and, this, and somebody sat down again. You see the same guys who sat down about the Starfighter and the special weapons. I don't know. Um, let's design this irking great big supersonic swing wing bomber. Yeah. All right, let's do that. And yeah. And let's, see, let's get these things like rotary things and we fire things out. Yeah. Let's make it really loud. <laughs> well, okay, we, we've done it right back at the beginning of the pod. We did two parts on the B1, which was great fun. The thing I love about it is the team that did the B1 had just come off the Valkyrie. So they've gone from <laughs> super mad to really, really mad. And then they end up with the B1B, which is just good old fashioned mad. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's that good sort of way, progression. Man. Yeah, it, it it's that sort of sixties thing of you know the stuff was a lot purer back in the day. Let's just <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was like you imagine the crews. Yeah, we, mm. we imagine the, the the briefing. You know, they have these sales briefings. Oh, they have big unveiling. You know, built. Bill, Bill Bailey and Layling. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, look what we got. We got the B, and you got these B fifty two crews. And they're sat in a corner with a bacon sandwich or whatever. Going, What's that? And, and <laughs> yeah, I mean, this 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 is the other thing, right? There's so many of the B fifty two crews. This is what we talked to Sonny Hilton about with the Hustler. Is they've all been promoted really really high, and they go don't like that. <laughs> we've got enough of these 52s knocking around why do we need that yeah we don't Ch um, change is change is bad change is bad yeah. we've got all of we, these we, we'll keep these we, it's, it's like the ways world scene isn't it we fear change yes. and, <laughs> and, <laughs> i'm sorry we fear change what but this is the future no it's not because what we can you know uh it does what then uh, we could do that but slower yeah. why do you need to go mark 1.8 yeah. yeah. uh, is that proven in combat well, this is. But this one here, he's had his tail put on the five times. Yeah. Same crew chief since 1955. Yeah. And, his, and his kids is number two. Yeah, you know, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry, it's a family business here. <laughs> um, but this is really interesting. We joke, but it's true. <laughs> yeah, but it is because 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 all of a sudden Reagan appears, doesn't he? And, and, and Reagan was really, for many things, but a saviour of the American arms industry because yeah. he was getting tired of, of constantly trying to outperform an adversary who was really, as we now know, a really good propaganda war. You know, the Soviets could have said they had a late, they had hamster, tra you know, hamsters trained to fire laser guns. The Americans would actually have done it. Yeah. You know, and such was the paranoia. And so, but, you know, you, Carter realised this was not sustainable. The, the idea was, you know, we conventional ground forces, we need to invest in them heavily. Where, where's the cuts going to come? And I think that helped certainly initially keep the B-52 in the air because had conventional armed forces not had to have this huge upgrade with Bradley and Abrams uh, and Humvees and stuff like that, it could have been a possibility. The B-52 could have been sacrificed for it. Well, the, the, co the costs for B-1 were skyrocketing. Which is why it, oh. was, it was cut, and they kept it around for a little while, and they did the cheaper version. Um, but 
it's yeah, it's still going. Still, is, but you know, it, it's it's that that whole sort of the mess Carter picks up fuel crisis, yeah, massive inflation, rampant aviation and military complex in there, which then gets absolutely battered fifteen years later with the the Last Supper. It, that's not a long time for massive rearmament, rejigging the B fifty two, re reappointing the B one to it all then going away again in the early 90s it's i've derailed the conversation because no no just because blows no, my mind that exactly as you're saying the money gets funneled somewhere else because it's the same sort of situation we're in now yes there's a lot of stuff that needs replacing but the thing that just kind of keeps going through it is the b-52 yeah yeah and, and i think at this point you know with the, with the old lags watching the the young jocks strutting around the b one b they're thinking no, lads, this is not the way ahead. And, and again, B-52, yes, it's slow. You don't want, you know, common sense dictates you do not want a supersonic bomber. Because conventional bombs, for a start, don't like travelling at supersonic speeds. They don't. You know, yep. when, when people see, you know, the F-15, they go, oh, look at that, all the bombs. Yeah, you wouldn't know about that, would you? Hey, eh? what do you mean? Yeah, you know, twice the speed of sound coming down the A-1. I'm sorry, you've lost me. Well, you know, super, no, it, it can't be supersonic when it has a live bomb load. Dear Mr. Be super- why do you think the B-58 <laughs> had a massive pod underneath it? Yeah. It, yeah. it was it, keeping things safe. Yeah, it was literally a shroud, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and, 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 there, and by doing that, you're, you're actually, rather than using the aircraft's strength, you're, magn- mag- you know, you're magnifying its weakness. Mm. You know, the B fifty, the F F fifteen, brilliant aircraft, a uh, great fighter, huge wing space, so we can carry our orders. Drop side is, it's tr- it's travelling at about six fifty miles an hour. That can be picked out of the sky. Mm. You know, anyone, with, you know, if you've got a decent pilot who likes a bit of gunnery, he's going to use it for gunnery practice, and that's it. You know, mission over. But with the B fifty two, yeah, it knows it's a plodder. It's designed to be a plodder. It's designed to carry ever increasing rates, which has I mean seventy thousand kilograms an hour. Yeah. You know, from the original ten thousand kilograms, uh, from the original design brief. And it's carrying them on on, on these huge three sided rails, plus internal, you know, they, they can they put in these rotary racks. You know, just for a few this thing is armed to the teeth, but from the from the outside it just looks like some museum piece. Yep. It has occasionally some really bad rose <laughs> art thrown on it. But what really says it's a good aircraft is they're bringing them back in. They're, they're, the ones that have been, some of the H's that have been mothballed are being brought up back into service for conversion to, to J and K fix, which I'll come on to in a minute. Mm. But what's quite interesting is that with Desert Golf, it really came into its own. And I'm sure there was more than one or two people in the RAF um, at PGHQ in Norwood, Northwood, thinking, well, I wish we still had the Lancaster. <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> the shock and awe of this thing. I mean, they, they flew one pretty low over some Iraqi lines. They were gone. They, those boys, were, they were out of their holes, guns behind. They were, they were running because it's as much a psychological weapon. Uh, yeah, and, and then you, you look at that and then if you're a serviceman on the ground and you see a B-52, it's like, well, there's a bit of home. There's a bit of stability. Mm-hmm. That there is our, this is what we're good at. You know, this is this is the equivalent of the Ford 57 red truck with the Christmas tree in the back. You know, whereas the Lancer is the, the Camaro. You've got this thing plodding along. It's stability. It's, and it's it's dependable. Yeah. Um, it's and really, the F- F-100, the Ford F-100 truck. There you go. That's that's to to bring this there. That's that's what the B fifty two is, just and, with and, yeah the big engine in the front. Yeah, and a lot of people thought that Desert Shield, Desert Storm would be a swan song, you know, because we had that those images of cruise missiles going down high streets and then taking a left while waiting before patiently waiting at the lights and carrying on. Mm. We were in this new age of very intelligent warfare. We we didn't need these bombers any longer. Um. Where did the cruise missiles come from? (laughs) There you go, you see. It's quite interesting. I I think and there's that disconnect, isn't there, which still exists, that it has to get so far. They've only got a limited range of 300 nautical miles. 
Yeah, most shipping. And, yeah. Sort of... and, and some places don't have a coast for a guided missile oh. destroyer to be sat off of. So what? What do you? So this was a bit of a saving grace for the B fifty two because while the crews must have been thinking, "This is it, lads." You know, we've got the defence cutbacks coming because the Americans were hit hard by those. They're going to get rid of us. All of a sudden, they're they're carrying upwards of ten guided cruise missiles, able to launch them in a standoff position, thousand miles. You know, however three hundred miles away, completely safely. They're proving their worth, and yet again, Boeing have proven they've they've created a design that's exceptionally um, adaptable and flexible. Mm-hmm. So you know, you, and, and all the while the avionics are being updated, you know, to the point now that they've, they've it's all digital now. All the solid state stuff has gone. Um, the weapon, you know, the, the weapon packs that they developed for Vietnam have now they used to slide in and out of special weapon bomb packs they've they've developed into these these sort of modular missile rotary missile launchers um while the rear gun has gone it's new defensive stuff's gone in the back of that um that the original crews can only dream of and then you've got the, but then you still got the ever sort of not, not perennial problem but there's, there's certainly the issue around the engine um and the updating of that and with all these defensive systems and offensive systems, they, you know, they're going to need changing it. And I think for over the past 10 years, the beef and they draw like so much more power than the engines can give them to, which is the yeah. thing that we're going to. And about, yeah, but again, it? people forget that, don't they? But, you know, we'll talk about it. But all the while you've got, you've got an aircraft. Well, it's a bit like Tigger's broom. I appreciate, you know, 15, 15 new X, Y and Z's and 14 of the other. But it, it's still going strong. The bomber of Theseus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let let's get on to the engine thing because I think the perennial question with it has never really been airframe; it's been engines, and it's been through I want to say four types. It's now. definitely had four different. Yeah, so yeah. it's on the J fifty sevens at the moment, I believe. Um, there's, there's just been the announcement for the. Well, I guess they're Allison, aren't they? But the the Rawls engine that they're going to put in it now. Um, which has gone straight out of my head. Um, uh, it's, on, it's, on the, it's on the book. Hang on. Is it in the book? Oh, I haven't scrolled down I'm that far sure. yet. Sure. Hang on. Yeah, I'm doing the same. Lee. Yeah. Read it. Listen up. Dear, dear, dear <laughs> listener, we are in hour three. Oh, hour three. Oh, more more, more we of both... this. Actually, we started early. We had technical problems. We've been going a long time. So it's taken you three three weeks to, to get all these episodes. This, this is a whole night for us. Uh, where are we? Um, we don't even got to the variants yet. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> eight ball NASA ball eight balls. I am trying to find it. And of course, if you want to know more about the NASA B fifty twos, see our video where Joe Welding and I climb around high and mighty one. The is it the last fifty two A that they've got out there at Pima, which they've just beautifully um, restored with uh, all of its NASA colours on. Um, this is just infuriating now because I'm sort of. It, this also shows how many variants because it's been so so long. You have so many variants of this aircraft. Yeah. What is interesting that they they didn't do a separate uh, reconnaissance version. They were going to, but then they decided against doing it because it was you know when it was introduced it was all arranged to have you know there was the RB twenty nine there was the RB fifty and the RB forty seven but there there was meant to be. There's an EB forty seven as well for yeah, electronic course, yeah. yeah. Uh, but they didn't do it with the um they were gonna do it with the B fifty two. but they did choose not to. So here we go. So yeah, so uh it's the Rolls Royce F F one thirty BR seven two five turbo fan. So Rolls uh, which... get get there in the end, even though they got knocked back with the, the mad two eleven deal in the nineties, but yeah. Which is why they bought Allison, wasn't it? Yeah. Is they, they they needed a US subsidiary to be able to, to bid for the contract. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah, Rolls Royce are not stupid. Uh, and again, you know, they their engines are pretty bulletproof. Um, well, we won't talk about the Trent 1000. Because... <laughs> 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 it, well, apart from that one, but, you know, but by and large. And the RB211, which I think is taxpayers we're still paying for, but. Oh, Maybe. we're paying off, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, there we go. Then, apart from it, 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 it's apart, also like... Apart from that, what have they ever done to... <laughs> yeah, what have they ever done for emotive power in aircraft? Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, and, and, and this is really interesting. 
because normally at this stage you would have been thinking it's going to be cheaper to just junk the fleet mm. because I'm sure uh, there are still the, the jigs for the the uh, R, the, the B1B floating about. The B21's on the horizon, but no, they want to invest, and I think it's actually brilliant because it shows foresight. Because while you've got the very advanced delivery systems, such as the B21 coming out, the B1B, the B2, um, sometimes you need a plodder. And not, and not every, not every, 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 you know, not everyone could be a, a Usain Bolt. No, but, I've, I've made a career out of being a plodder. So. <laughs> a sports prevention <laughs> officer, mate. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> Um, and, and so, you know, Boeing, have, but it, but it's quite interesting because they've not rushed into it. Mm. And for Boeing, of late, they've struggled. Uh, we were we were talking about this earlier. They recently lost the head of defence of space, a guy called Ted Colbert. Uh, he, he 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 went earlier in the week. Uh, we were talking. So today we're talking on the twenty sixth of September. He this guy went earlier in the week. I know you won't be listening to that. Man. So you know, this is quite interesting because Boeing aren't having a great time. Uh, civil aviation they're struggling. I mean, it's almost like a re- you know, repeat of the early thirties, late tw- late twenties, early thirties. Interesting that it's um, nearly a century on. Yeah, you know, they, they say most most businesses last three generations. Aviation seems to be def- you know define that quite nicely. But Boeing are. They need they need a they need a win, and they need a solid win, not a quick win. With mean, the F fifteen variants, that's always you know, I can't they can't really claim the lineage. And I'm not saying that they would for a moment, but I, I think with the B fifty two, they have an icon, uh, and it's in their interest to invest in it, even though they only have one user, which is the American, you know, USAF. Uh, because NASA's H that they were going to have originally to replace the, the previous uh, it was the B that they had in service. Yeah. Balls A, they've retired, yeah. NASA, yeah, Balls A, what an aircraft. Mm. I mean, the stuff that they did with that, it's, it's a pity they've not retained one. But I can understand in a way, things have changed, technology's changed. But it's, it is, it's amazing that Boeing have just kept on with, with the mark, with the B-52. And yeah, this this is, I suppose, brings us to an interesting point that you have these three and a half. We'll, we'll keep the forty seven in, in the mix as well because it's yeah. It gave the Strato Fortress the Strato, but even though Boeing named everything in the fifties Strato, so you had Strato Tank, <laughs> Strato Cruiser. Um, it's like two thousand again, nineteen ninety nine, when everyone was naming everything Millennia. <laughs> yeah, goodness. But we are what it's so it's twenty twenty four now. So we are twenty years off of this being the Century aircraft. It's being re engines. They have enough low hour spars and wings out in the desert of Amart to keep keep them going for a while. Because the wing itself hasn't changed. No, this is this is, this is no. This is the interesting bit that. You know, I, I was, just yeah, just for the AV geeks out there, the reason we have two Lancasters flying around at the moment is because we've got lots of Shackleton spars kicking about. Yeah. When you hear of a Lank being respired, it's getting a Shackleton spar. So yeah, there is that. That's just a weird thing. But this thing has got a nice backlog of them sitting out there in the Arizona desert, ready to be hooked up. Yeah, and again, you know, if if you look. Um, what what spares and availability there is for the B fifty two, you know, and the fact they're bringing some of them back online, just a testimony again to the design and the build of the of, of the the original. Um, I'm sure in nineteen sort of late nineteen forties when they were doing the penning, the drawing, and then going to the model shop to make to make the original uh, scale model, they had, I'm sure a lot of the guys in the room at the time would go, ladies involved, thought this thing would be flying fifty years later, let alone you know 100 and with with you know the, the aim with this sort of upgrade to j and k status and standard this will yeah this will see it become a 100 year aircraft it'll be you know alongside the the, the c-130 hercules um definitely mm-hmm. and, and that in itself poses more points of contemplation in that have Boeing designed the ultimate bomber? Mm. 
Well, yeah, I mean, judging on the face of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, I sp- okay, so he- here's something. Did they design three? As we wrap up our three-part yeah. epic recording, well, it's three-part for the listener. It's been one really long <laughs> one for us. <laughs> Have yeah, they we've been act- one toy, one comfort break. <laughs> mm. Yeah, we've we, we've hard we've been hardcoring this one, white knuckling all the way through. Have they actually designed three ultimate bombers? When we think about them within the context of their time, so in the Second World War, you have the B seventeen in in Europe and the B twenty nine in the Far East in the Pacific through two wars. And then you have the B-52 carrying that lineage on into a very different type of conflict. Could we say instead of the ultimate bomber being the B-52, they've actually bullseyed this thing three times. Unlike say- You're right. Let's take a British example, Avro. Got it right with the Lancaster to a degree and then the Vulcan was a beautiful thing, but never a bit of a mish mishy mash for for everything else again could do both conventional and nuclear role but it's gone whereas they've had this progression that has kept going for a hundred nearly a hundred years you you're you're right you know as as we said with the b-17 it's an icon you you think american bombers and second world war b-17 uh the the b-29 b-50 did two world wars It was used for everything from weather surveillance through to the the journey, you know, the initial journeys that we made through the sound barrier. You come to the B-52, you've got got a bomber that has just carried ever-growing loads, operated in, you know, throughout the Cold War, in that sort of, that that peace period, uh, into the war against terror. Yep. It still goes, you know, it still goes strong, while also aiding the development of space flight and, and again, you know, te- technological developments, as well as fulfilling a whole host of roles. You know, the, the, the variant section at the back of the book, I've pretty much got all, got them all there. And you know, this thing was, it was remarkable, and the fact that the Boeing had designed aircraft that was so easy to retrofit or add updates to is absolutely testimony uh, to the ethos, which can be traced back, as you already said, to the B-17. You know, that had a lot of retrofitting between marks. Uh, the B-29, that, had, that certainly had retrofitting, you know, oh, yeah. Battle of Kansas, and it, and it handled it very well. Uh, B-50 less so because it was, it was what it was. It's the B-50. We don't need to do a great deal. B-47 was a very important aircraft in this story as far as it was a bridge. It was a bridge between the first generation of jets and the second generation of jet. We now have a second generation of jet air powered aircraft that is coming up to be in service with the sixth, sixth generation. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's an absolutely unique claim to fame. It, it's, it's a remarkable legacy and it's shocking and fascinating to see the state of the company that produced it. Um, that that sort of rut they got themselves in of innovating and refining a design when they probably should have done the clean paper thing 20 years ago. You know, that, that there's, there's interesting legacy things there on top of, you know, the, the GE McDonnell Douglas influence on, on the company going forward, but they have in the past known when to start again. And then recently, especially in their commercial division, they haven't. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Sorry, Boeing. I really do. What I just said, the commercial division has lost it this way. I think they reached. It, it, it's almost as if they got to be, you know, the seven four seven, and went, yeah, we're good now. Mm-hmm. Anything that followed was just yeah, happy days. Unlike Airbus, who have continuously innovated. Um, good for them, actually. Uh, if you're listening from Airbus, Matt and I will have seats. And, you know, first class A380, somewhere nice, groovy. Um, I've, I've but, been down to Toulouse and, and, and toured, toured the facility and that, that, oh goodness, that's nearly 20 years ago since I, but they were already talking the stuff that has come and gone then. You know, A380 was the big banner sort of marketing thing, but it's, 
what they were talking about that they're putting onto things like the Neo and the new um, 220. They are yeah. already looking beyond that. It's 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 a remarkable <clears throat> remarkable um, way of approaching design. Less said about the A four hundred M. That's better, but... <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't really talk about that one. <laughs> so not the can, can can something that um, never flies be called an airplane? <laughs> so, sorry. I mean, no, but, but again, it, it, it's interesting, you know, when you look at manufacturers, you look at Lockheed, yeah, okay, they've, they've not had a great time with the F-35. We, I think we can all agree on that. Mm. But with, with the with the uh, Lancaster, no, the Hercules, <laughs> Seymour 30, they've done really well. They have. Yeah. The J had teething problems, but they were all over it. They didn't let it mm. fester. They, they got on with it. The F-35, the whole history of the F-35, it was always going to be, for want of a better word, a pain in the arse. Of an aircraft, yeah. and then if you look at Boeing, you know, the, the, the commercial side of it, and, and highlighted, and I, I appreciate that Starliner is part of the defence element of it, but some of that has to spill over into commercial, and they have to say at some point, yes, we're also partially responsible for the development of a, of a potential first big outer atmosphere disaster, and it is sad because this is a, this is the company that gave us the two four seven, which ushered yeah. in a whole new era. Of, of civil aviation, it, you know, it gave us the B seventeen. See, see our pre shooter. previous pod, Ben, about the two four seven, when we wax lyrical about how wonderful that one is. Well, yeah, you're other, you're yeah you know me. Yeah, well, the ball, aviation, civil aviation, but can can they get out of it? I think they can, but it, it is going to re require commercial uh, um, and professional bravery and integrity, and it's going to require Boeing. To just go, we fouled up. How do we get out of the situation in which we found ourselves? They cannot rely on the F-15 and the B-52 forever because they don't export the B-52. And that, that, but I think they will. But it will be it'll be a painful and rather hard journey. I I think it's going to be an interesting journey to watch from outside, and there are some great people keeping tabs on it, re reporting it, especially the, the the team at the the Seattle Seattle Tribune. Um, uh, they're being held to account. And I think the big step for Boeing will be to take their eyes off the share price and put it back onto the engineering, which I think the, the new boss is trying to do. But I think there's too many people there with histories that are probably going to take some moving before they can make the big, make the big bets. And I think it would not surprise me in the next 12 months if we hear 737 replacement 797. They've got to bet big on something and they can't keep flogging that airplane. No. No, it's... Um, I, I was sure the end of the war, they'll, they'll turn it around. They have no opportunity. They have no choice because, you know, they they have tied level pegging with Airbus for so long. It's been a sort of almost continuous jockeying who is the better producer of air aircraft. And in the rear view mirror, they, they must be looking at what's happening in China. Mm, yep. They must be they must be getting, they must be starting to sweat a little bit around the collar because I tell you what, yes, the you know Chinese aviation, civil aviation is still very much early days, but we have seen how Chinese technology catches up. And we, you know, people laugh at it and then all of a sudden it's it's a big contender. Was it? Is it the um, C the CJ the the little civilian thing they've got at the moment? Yeah, but yeah. they yeah, they they had a big show at Dada Stand and mm. uh, yeah. I didn't get this year at all, which is much my fault. <laughs> God, I was too busy writing, <laughs> <laughs> writing a moving house. Um, so you know, it, it it it's one of those things. But yeah, Boeing can do better, and they should do better, and they've got a legacy to protect, and it's in their interest because, you know. People who've gone before them, Claire Edvelt, uh, Lisa Wood, Eddie Allen, the men and women who built, designed, and flew their aircraft. It doesn't matter. There is There has to be some sort of moral obligation to ensure that that memory is maintained uh, and the integrity is certainly buffed up, ready for putting back on the shelf uh, of corporate identity. Ben, this has been a lot of fun. It's been really long. Thanks ever so much for your time, mate. I really appreciate it. And listener, thanks for bearing with us. Yeah, I, you know, originally, dear listener, we, we were going to time box this and do 15 minutes on each, have a nice hour-long podcast and be done. And um, 
Ben said, I think we can talk a bit more about that. So in my head, I was like, let's just re go and see how long this takes. It's taken a while. And the edit for this is going to be fun. But Ben, this has been a lot of... Okay, here we go. Sorry. Let's do the Sophie's Choice to, to wrap up. You can only have one. <laughs> oh. <sighs> the new house has B20 got a big garden. The B29. Big garden. Will, that, will that fit in the garden? B no, so it'll have to be the B17. But if it's going to be the B17, it's going to be the uh, it's it's going to be the F because that's that's a nice sleek looking aircraft. Mm. It's 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 the one. Yeah. Oh no, change choice B17F. Sorry, G. I know you were the guy, but there you go. Thank you so Curious much. And this has been a lot of fun. <laughs> and, well, Matt, thank you so much for your time and your candor, mate. Really appreciate it. And listener, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you ever so much for your support. I cannot thank Ben Skipper enough for spending as much time as he did. Like I said, I think we topped out in just over four hours recording these three episodes. And it was great fun. And many thanks to the team at Pen and Sword for letting me have a look at all of the books as well. You can get them now via just about anywhere, really. Uh, Pen and Sword in, in Europe, and I think it's Casemates in the States. Links are in the description below so you can find out more about the books. And of course, about Ben as well. He joined us to talk about civil aviation after 100 years. And we even started about talking by, about monks jumping off of towers and things. It was a great discussion. All of that great stuff is in the description below. And as I said in the intro, we're heading out to Pima once again. So we're going to be doing some fun stuff while we're there. And if you want to be finding out about what is happening early, maybe even get us to do some videos specifically for an aircraft that you want to see out there, become a Damcastier on Patreon from just £3 a month, plus a bit of that. Everything goes towards supporting the podcast, keeping the lights on and the microphones primed. It's good fun. And we'll be getting the socials going as well, just as soon as I can come up for air. But we've got some fun things coming up on the show. Dan Cassius here about it first, but just to tease a few bits and pieces, we're going to be looking at some aircrew book review, hopefully. We're going to be looking at a friendly fire incident involving the RAF and the Royal Navy in August 1944, and a few other things that I'm really excited to share. Become a Dan Kister, you'll hear about it first. So thank you to Ben and to Pen and Sword. Check out the Flightcraft series. It is really, really good fun. Thank you to Pima. Thank you to Tom at 909 for my t-shirts. And of course, thank you to Ramon at Boneyard Safari for letting me continue to delve into all of his fantastic photography to make the videos over on YouTube work as well as they do. Let me know how we're doing in the comments. Like, subscribe, stick some stars into your podcast app of choice. And until next time, thank you so much for sticking with us through this little mini series. Let me know if you like this format and I can package up sort of longer form series on a specific type or range of aircraft and we can we can take it from there i'd love to do the first four airliners uh the comet the tu124 oh it's going straight out of my head the 707 and and um the avro one as well because that would be a lot of fun just need to find the people for that but that's the sort of thing let me know in the comments below like subscribe do all that good sort of thing and until next time do take care of yourselves mm -hmm. thank you so much for watching and until next time Bye-bye. I just want to say many thanks to our fabulous Dam Casteers on Patreon. If you head over to our Patreon page, you can join the crew and get your name in the credits from just £3 a month plus a bit of that. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bowen and is a Boney Abroad podcast production.